So our next speaker will be uh, William Hatch. William is a grad student at Utah. It's a wonderful place to be a grad student. Um, this should become shortly uh, should become clear shortly. I don't actually tell my grad students, "Hey, you should go build a shell," um, but that's what William decided to do. So we're going to hear about it now. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> we've seen some languages already, and now we're going to see one by a guy who just loves to throw craft together really quickly using shell scripts. Uh, so I made Rash. It's a it's a shell language, and I love Unix shells. Uh, I love to just live in the terminal, interact with the computer through text, um, and I, you know, I see myself repeating commands and things, and I think, ah, I'll make a shell script. Uh, so I love to wrap things up and gradually kind of um, abstract over things I do. Uh, but shell scripts or shell languages have a lot of issues. Bash and friends, for instance, uh, data structures. They have no real data structures. You just get like strings and arrays. There are no modules, so it's hard to uh, share your code between different scripts. Uh, there are a lot of safety issues. Um, the defaults are all kind of bad, and you can add flags to change some of the behavior, but often that's still not what, really what you want. And as your script go grows and you add more and more features, eventually you kind of hit a brick wall and you say, well, it's time to throw this out and re-implement from scratch in another language. Uh, so here's a little example of like some syntax. So we have if and phi, that's a little funky. I can live with that, though. Um, it's a little weirder that these brackets aren't actually part of the bash syntax. It's an external program. It's clever, but it kind of has some issues. For instance, the real problem with this is it's almost right. It works most of the time, but if you get an empty string, the test program suddenly gets one fewer argument, and it blows up. So you really need to quote those variables to not have it do that. So you have to know all these kind of defensive coding strategies. Um, but what I love about Shell, well, there are several things. But there are two things I'm going to focus on. One is pipelines. So here we have a pipeline of four programs. And you just get to write it in this lovely, succinct syntax. And in most programming languages, running four program or just running one program is going to be more syntactic hassle than this, let alone uh, wiring together four of them. Uh, so, since shell languages all do kind of, they do these things, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, the second thing, is the nice line-based syntax. It's really nice for interactive use, because uh, it wanted to be an interactive user interface before a programming language. Uh, so you don't have to put a semicolon on the end of thing. There's no lots of irritating parentheses. Um, you just type what you want, hit enter, and go. So, since it has these things that it does so well, but everything else, it kind of, uh, it has to stand, stand on its own as a language, so it put in all these kind of general purpose programming things, and they all are kind of bad. So wouldn't it be great to put shell inside, put the good things of shell inside a general purpose programming language that does those things well, and have them kind of flow seamlessly together? So that's why I created Rash. Uh, so you can write stuff like this in it. That's what it's going to look like. But let's go through what builds it. Uh, it's made of four parts. The lowest part is my shell pipeline library. It deals with functions and processes that deal with byte streams and wiring them together. On top of that, I've built a mixed pipeline that deals with objects. So we have functions that take and produce objects, and also mixing them with the previous pipelines that just deal with byte streams. On top of that, there's a macro DSL layer that gives you a nice syntax. And it's extensible. Uh, there's a lot of sugar there to make useful things. And um, it's also built to be very flat and friendly for using just on a command line, and it synergizes with this last part, which is orthogonal, but they kind of work together well, which is uh, the line syntax. It's a reader and macro support uh, for just having a really nice line-based syntax. Uh, so the elephant in the room uh, talking here at RacketCon is there's Skeesh. If there's already a shell written in uh, Scheme, why did I make a new one? Why didn't I just port this? And I feel Skeesh kind of accomplishes a slightly different goal. Uh, it definitely has uh, stuff for running uh, processes and functions that work on byte streams. And it has a macro DSL wrapper. But Skeesh, uh, the macros, and mine are very different. Skeesh has a lot of parentheses, heavy nesting. It's not really something you want to write on a command line. And I really wanted that, so mine is quite different. And also adds uh, object pipelines, since like PowerShell 
that's obviously, you want to work with objects and not just bytes, and the line syntax so it's nice interactively, et cetera. So let's look at the pieces. First is shell pipeline. The main function in this, and actually all of them have a run pipeline function, uh, but you just give it specifications of what programs you want to run. So we have ls, grep, et cetera. We can add flags to do output redirection and other things. And also we can uh, put in racket functions. So here my grep is defined as a racket function and we can put it in the middle of the pipeline and it just has to read and write to send it out and whatnot. Uh, <clears throat> so going up to the mixed pipeline, uh, we've seen with normal Unixy pipelines, you get a byte stream, uh, which in racket is essentially a port. And with object pipes, we just want functions that pass around objects, and we're really just changing the way we're writing them. Uh, when they go together, a Unix pipe, since it can produce a port, obviously, a port is already a racket object, so that's convenient. The other way, uh, we have to squish things down into a byte stream, which we're gonna do just by printing most of the time. <coughs> but uh, the syntax for that one is nothing great, but uh, let's look at the wrapper for it. So here we have the pipeline macro, and this run pipeline recognizes these uh, words that are in purple or maybe blue, depending on what you see. It. But uh, they have also equal signs around them. That's my convention for writing pipeline operators. So the operators themselves are macros that get to determine how they take their input and produce uh, the pipeline specifications. Uh, so being macros, they get to play all sorts of fun tricks. For instance, the Unix pipe can automatically quote identifiers that it gets so you don't have to quote them or put them in uh, strings or anything. The object pipe can generate something that will detect whether or not it gets a port and turn that into a string automatically because that's usually what you want. Uh, this filter is just nice sugar. You always filter in pipelines. So this lets you just write essentially the body of a lambda rather than having the lambda and parentheses and everything. So nicer to fit it in. And both the filter and object pipes automatically will, you see there's no explicit reference to the previous argument. They'll stick that in automatically for you if you don't explicitly say where it is. Obviously we want to use shorter names on a like an interactive shell. Um, so I'm gonna use shorter names for most of the talk. And also the first one we can usually leave off. Uh, since run pipeline can tell obviously where the operators are, it can tell if it starts, w if it doesn't start with one, and there's a syntax parameter that lets us determine what is the current default. Also, having these pipeline operators let us do, uh, have different choices. For instance, I've always in Bash wished that uh, globs actually had a slightly heavier syntax. I've multiple times accidentally put a star or a question mark somewhere, forgetting it was a glob character and had things blow up horribly and do things I didn't want. So I want the top one, some non-autoglobbing shell or pipeline operator, but most people probably want the bottom one that's just more convenient for uh, putting them in easily. So with customizable operators, we can both get what we want. And you can let your imagination run wild. I haven't written all of these, I've written a couple, but uh, there are all sorts of fun things that you can do with these to have just a quick syntax that you can put on one line uh, for all sorts of things. Uh, finally, let's look at the shell syntax, or the, the line syntax. So the first thing we definitely need to do is get rid of the parentheses, which normally I love, but on the interactive command line, I don't. So we're gonna have the beginning and end of line basically be like parentheses. So here we apply this function, it all works as we expect. Um, also, it detects whether or not the line starts with a specially tagged macro called the line macro, and it will insert a default if there isn't one there. So supposing app is the default, we can leave it off. It's generally not going to be the default, but another line ma macro we want is CD. Uh, it's a classic uh, in operating systems courses and stuff where they make you write a shell. It's always, oh, CD can't, it has to be a shell built in and not an external program uh, because it's affecting the environment of the shell itself. Uh, and here we want it as a line macro so that we can not quote things, and just write it on the line as fast as we can. Obviously where we're going is that run pipeline is the line macro that we want most of the time. And as the default, we can just leave it off, write ls, pipe, grep, whatever. Also the pipe character is a normal character in this hash lang, uh, so we can use it like this. Uh, we don't always want to eschew the parentheses though. Sometimes we 
want to use them. So anytime you put parentheses in the middle of a pipeline, it's an escape to full-on normal racket. So here we can compute the arguments to ls using racket code. Um, additionally, sometimes we want to bypass the line stuff. As, as nice as it is to avoid parentheses, sometimes we, we like them. So we can just, any line that starts with an open paren is treated as a normal racket form instead of as the line macro stuff. So you can just dump in any normal racket code. So the nice thing about this, or one of the nice things about this, is we can actually use it as kind of a drop-in replacement for racket base most of the time. 99 point however many nines of racket code are going to start with an open paren. Uh, the only reason to really put something without parentheses on the top level is to have it print the value out. Uh, so here, the only thing that would break if we change it to hash laying rash is this B, because uh, it'll now get a line macro inserted. We can fix that obviously by wrapping it in parentheses, or we could make like some identity line macro. Uh, so this syntax is useful in either files or as an interactive rap REPL that gives you everything you normally want in Racket plus, say, shell commands. So control flow, I didn't add any funky one-off uh, for loops or if forms to the line syntax. I figure by the time I'm ready to write control flow, I'm ready to write a parenthesis. So Rash just uses normal Racket if, for, etc. Um, but now that we've seen how to escape from Rash to Racket, uh, we need to see how to go the other way around as well. So never fear, there's a macro for that. Uh, this Rash macro uh, inside the for loop takes this string and runs it as uh, Rash code. These funny angly things, they're called guillemets. They're used in a lot of other natural languages like Spanish. The way in English we use curly tick marks as quotes. And in Racket, the way these work in Rash and other things that use the common package is that they create a string that balances its delimiters and has no escaping. So you can nest them arbitrarily deep without having extra nesting stuff. Um, and this string also, it doesn't live on at runtime. It's not evaluated or anything. But at compile time, this macro takes it and reads it and turns it into syntax objects with proper location and hygiene information. Uh, so the, the string here is really just trying to delimit where one reader is used and where another is. Of course, some people haven't liked the GMA things. You can also use the at reader, so do whatever you like. Uh, one thing I do like about the GMA sort of method, though, is it can also produce these kind of implicit identifiers. So these funny triangle uh, parens here, they read as the same as the GMA, but also produce this hash percent upper triangles. So if we bind that to be the rash macro, we can switch languages by just using funny parentheses. So here, in the middle of this for loop, we've got racket embedded in rash, embedded in rash, embedded in racket, and we just had to use switch back and forth between which parentheses we were using. Uh, and if you don't like funny Unicode things, you can just use like braces or something too. Um, so one slight disclaimer, the library is not entirely stable. It's uh, got a few rough edge edges. Everything here works, but uh, there are th there are two dues to be done. So let's have a quick demo. So everything that I was going to do, I think I have in my command history. So obviously, you know, we can do ls pipe to things. We can do aliases. Um, here we have a list. We embed it. We filter it. We send it to cowsay, so we can have racket and Unix programs like the wonderful cowsay working together. Also, one thing that's done in say PowerShell is they've, at least on Windows, implemented a lot of system administration sort of commands uh, in C Sharp that produce objects. So here, I've implemented a PS wrapper that uh, the prompt knows how to print it out nicely as a table, but uh, it's giving me an object. So I can sort it by keys rather than doing uh, ad hoc parsing on the command line in the middle, in the middle of the pipeline. Anyway, that's, that's a look at it. So to conclude, we take the nice parts of shell, it wants to be just a really simple DSL. We put it inside Racket and make it so you can easily and seamlessly switch between the two, and it lets you both on the command line do nice things, and it lets you grow shell scripts more from starting as a shell script and gradually replace things and put them in full Racket rather than just throwing them away completely. Uh, so yeah, thanks.
Okay, one question. Yes? Uh, yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, am I planning on doing stuff like T and Bash? Uh, well, you can just put in T if you want. It's an external program. Uh, but uh, you can do redirections to like arbitrary ports. I haven't put anything in yet to make that really nice. But you could put some sugar, a pipeline that uh, has a good way of saying that, for instance. So it's possible. All right. If you have more questions and you're ready to give up on Thanks. Bash, then catch William later today. <laughs>